people have been fishing on the Great Lakes for thousands of years. Today's tribal, commercial, and sport fishers continue that tradition, setting nets and catching fish for recreation, food, and income. The nets that tribal and commercial fishermen use can be a hazard for sport fishers and other boaters, but if you know what to look for, you will greatly reduce the risk of becoming entangled. Amy Eggstad, a warden with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, explains. Basically, if you see orange flags, um, the buoys, stay away from them. Do not go in between them because that means there's uh, nets down below. Be observant. If you're trolling, carefully scan the water ahead of you. If you come upon a buoy, slow down or stop and look around. See anything, Tom? Yeah, is that one over here? There will probably be more buoys nearby. You want to steer clear of all of them. Don't go between the buoys. Yep. I think that's see the, the other end? Yeah, that might be it there. Let me see. Yep. Yeah, that's okay. the other end there. Let's go around here. Yeah, we'll go around that way. When the weather's bad or the light is low, you're much more likely to get entangled. If it is dusk or dawn or foggy, it's it's very hard to, to see, obviously in front of you. If you have a radar, you really got to be watching that radar, even when it's not foggy, because that will help you uh, with some of the buoys as they pop up. You can kind of see where one, if you see one all of a sudden dot coming up, and then another fixed dot, that'll really help, especially if it is foggy. Two kinds of nets are widely used, trap nets and gill nets. On the trap nets, they are required on their staff to have um, some reflective, so at night, you know, if you got a light shining, they are supposed to be reflective. They have the reflective tape on there. The gill net buoys are not required to have that, though. So it's, uh, it's, it's, you got to think about when, when you're going and is it worth it to go out at that time uh, if it's not good visibility during the day. Planning your trip should start well before you hit the water. In Wisconsin waters of Lake Superior or Lake Michigan, call your local warden at the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and ask where the nets are. In Wisconsin or Michigan waters of Lake Superior, you can also contact the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. The number is area code 715-685-2114. It's also helpful to read notices at public landings that give the locations of nets. You can always call the local uh, wardens. We have a good idea where the nets are, uh, kind of the hot spots for that, that time that of year when they are fishing, so for you can be aware of it. It's good to know what lies beneath the various buoys. Trap nets are much more elaborate than gill nets. Trap nets are designed to channel fish into an enclosed area called a pot. They can be an acre in size. The nets rest on the bottom of the lake and may rise up as high as 30 feet. The tops of the nets may be 10 to 50 feet below the surface of the water. Only marker buoys and flags float on the surface. Trap nets include two large wing nets and a lead net between them. These are placed closest to shore. Markings on the buoys vary from state to state. In Wisconsin waters, the lead net is marked with a brightly colored buoy, which often has two flags and reflective tape. The wing anchors are marked only with floats. The wing nets and the lead come together at the pot. This is the deep end of the net, and it may be far offshore. A buoy with a single orange flag marks where the pot is. A single dark flag often marks the anchor on the deepest part of the net. Here's an overhead view of the whole setup, including the pot, nets, and anchors. Trap nets are large and heavy and are rarely dislodged by currents. 
The other nets you'll find are gill nets. These are much simpler than trap nets. They're designed so that fish's gills get caught in the nets. Gill nets are hung in a straight line running from shallow to deeper water. These nets are usually 800 to 1,000 feet long, although some may run to 8,000 feet long. They can float near the surface, or they can rest on the bottom. As with trap nets, boaters will see only the buoys marking gill nets. Most gill nets are marked with two flags at the shallow end and a single flag at the deep end. Both kinds of nets can be a problem for people fishing. Like submerged trees or man-made objects, they can snag your gear. And storms, wind, and ice can break them loose from their anchors. Fishermen can troll through them and dislodge them. This happens most often for gill nets, but it can happen to trap nets too. They're then known as ghost nets. They often sink after they break loose, but they may float for a bit. They may continue to catch fish for a while, and they may entangle birds. Ghost nets can be hard to see and dangerous to encounter. If a net breaks free and becomes a ghost net, you can catch your propeller in it. If you do get caught in a net, the first thing you must do is free yourself immediately. If waves are moderate to large, getting befouled can be a serious hazard. It's just like a big heavy anchor on the back of your boat where you don't want that anchor to be if you had one. Uh, it's dragging the back of the end of the boat and the water can come over the back of the boat. You're not able to move and eventually your boat will become uh, overfilled with water. If that happens, you'll be glad you're following the law. If you are sport trolling, uh, you're trolling uh, out on the Great Lakes, um, you are required by state law to have some sort of wire cutter or another device um, to immediately severe that downrigger line uh, or fishing line. So there's different types. This is a very, this one goes through a lot, but these do uh, work as well. If you're fishing with downriggers, don't try to save your terminal tackle. Immediately cut your downrigger wires. Saving $40 worth of tackle is not worth having your boat swamped by a following wave. Whoa, 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 whoa. What was that? Oh boy. Uh oh. oh. Oh, all right. Okay, I'm a neutral. All right, you got a neutral? Ooh, there's a gill net on here, Al. I'm gonna have to cut it. You got them snips? Yeah, yeah, right here. Mark this spot, I'm gonna cut it. Yeah, I'll mark it. He's marked. There it goes, okay, we're free. Good. It's unlikely, but if your prop becomes fouled by netting or a float rope, cut yourself free with the knife. Yeah. We got a net on there. Okay. I'm gonna cut it off. Okay, can you reach it? Yep, I should be able to get back here. Oh, she's really on there. I'm just gonna let it go, Al. Yeah. You wanna oh, mark yeah, this? I got it marked. All right, here it goes. Okay, I'm putting her down. We're free. When you're free of the entanglement, look around. If you see no sign of flags, you may have encountered a ghost net. You should then take a GPS reading. You can then report the net's position to the DNR or to the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. It helps tremendously if you can tie a buoy or bottle or other floating marker to the net. This makes it far easier for agencies to find and retrieve it. Well, we asked the fishermen if, they, uh, if they're in an area where commercial fishing is going on, that they might carry a jug and a little bit of line with them. And if they do come across a ghost net, get their gear stuck in the ghost net, they can, they can take that jug and the little bit of line they have and attach it to that net or just set the, a little weight and the jug on the bottom to mark that net for us. Uh, this saves us an obscene amount of time when we have to come back and look for this net. A lot of times when people take GPS coordinates, as you can see right now, we're drifting. We've drifted 400 yards already. And if somebody's got their gear, by the time they get their gear un untangled, get to the GPS, they've moved two or 300 yards, now we're looking in the wrong spot for this net. 
This saves us a lot of work and we appreciate everybody's help and we're trying to re recover these ghost nets. Be sure to leave the net in the water. It is a federal offense to remove a tribal gill net from the water. If you're in Lake Superior, you can tell the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission where the net is. You can call Glyphwick at area code 715-685-2114 or go to glifwc.org. Under Focus Areas on the right and then under Great Lakes Fishery, there's a link to Report a Ghost Net. There's also a link to that site at greatlakesghostnets.org. Or call or text the Wisconsin DNR hotline at area code 800-847-9367. That's area code 800-TIP-WDNR. Glyphwick or the DNR can then retrieve the net. Again, ghost nets can be floating or suspended in the water. If you are fishing near the lake bottom, you may get caught on another obstruction, like a sunken tree or branch. Healthy and sustainable Great Lakes fisheries benefit state and local economies. Sport, commercial and tribal fishers all depend on this resource. It's important to understand the markings of commercial and tribal nets and avoid them if possible. If you do get caught, you now know what to do. All users can enjoy the benefits of these greatest of lakes.